essentially a warp drive is a way to travel faster than the speed of light without breaking the uh, speed limit of the speed of light, uh, which is uh, a fairly uh, confounding thing to do, but it is possible uh, from uh, even some of the earliest uh, solutions to Einstein's field equations, uh, you could see that there were particular geometries of space-time uh, that would enable uh, signals within those geometries to travel faster than the speed of light uh, without actually uh, uh, ever really surpassing the speed of light. Uh, and the way that that's possible is that uh, the objects themselves don't even necessarily have to move. Uh, they could be as motionless as can be conceiv uh, conceived, uh, and the space around them can move, i.e. the geometry can change. Uh, now, there's no limit to how quickly uh, space-time geometry can change. So uh, if uh, an object is in a particular space-time geometry, and that space-time geometry begins to change, it can be transported uh, from outside frames of references what looks like instantaneously to a new, no new location. Uh, and there's se several uh, ways in which this is un understood to be permitted uh, via uh, the, the uh, you know, stipulations of general relativity. Uh, in particular, uh, the Einstein-Rosenbridge solution, uh, which is popularly known as uh, wormholes. Uh, that's one mechanism uh, that allows for uh, a quasi-instantaneous or, or uh, superluminal uh, uh, travel. Uh, then there's also, more recently, uh, things like the Alcubierre warp drive, uh, which is, again, solutions to Einstein's field equations. Uh, that describe a mechanism to expand and contract space in such a manner that uh, you, you almost form like a wave that propels the ship along. Again, the ship itself isn't, doesn't even need to be physically moving. It's propelled along with the, the uh, contracting and expanding space-time, uh, and you can go arbitrarily fast. Uh, you know, two times the speed of light, three times the speed of light. There, there's no limit. Uh, now, one of the reasons why uh, scientists don't jump out of their seat about this is because uh, it's erroneously thought that in order to have a condition where you expand space, uh, you need some kind of exotic matter. You need something with negative energy, negative mass. Uh, and so it's uh, erroneously considered that wormholes will collapse the moment they form. Uh, because the space will contract, you know, you'd, uh, you'd have to have some kind of exotic matter with negative energy uh, that goes into the throat to keep the wormhole stable and open. And similarly, with like the Alcubierre warp drive, you need some kind of form of exotic matter uh, expanding the space uh, around the ship. Uh, and well, so things, uh, uh, states with negative mass and negative energy have been observed in the laboratory. Uh, although these are extremely small quantities, uh, the, the amount you needed for an Alcubierre warp drive would be a, an amount of negative mass e equivalent to uh, like the mass of Jupiter or something like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not, not entirely feasible, but uh, where Nassim, where his unified physics comes in, uh, you, you see it in a different light. Uh, and it, it does almost make you jump out of your seat because um, you don't need this negative energy, this exotic matter, uh, although there, there are ways to get that. Uh, but but uh, just the action of spin and charge will expand space. Uh, so, uh, calculations run on wormholes that normally uh, they consider them as static because uh, 
for some reason, uh, there's some question among astronomers and astrophysicists about whether a black hole is spinning or not spinning. They're always spinning. <laughs> but uh, when they're working out some of the equations, they have it as a static solution. Uh, and when you have a static solution, the, your wormhole, your einstein rosen bridge, closes off immediately. You can't travel through it faster than light. But uh, there's never going to be a condition where the wormhole is not spinning and does not have charge going through it. And when you do the calculations, with spin and with charge, the wormhole is stable, uh, i.e. Uh, the, the spin and the charge function to uh, expand space and keep the bridge portion of the Einstein-Rosen bridge stable and open. Uh, well, similarly, uh, you can use spin and charge like a splitting uh, plasma magnetohydrodynamic device uh, to expand space or contract space, uh, depending on how you modulate uh, the, the spinning plasma. Uh, and so this uh, begins to show a feasible way to construct a warp drive. Uh, and it's one of the things that Nassim is working on, uh, making a warp drive with this kind of uh, uh, technology. Uh, and it's uh, probably, you know, one of the uh, most uh, pivotal breakthroughs that's needed to engage in interstellar travel um, for a number of different reasons, but um, it is certainly possible. Yeah, well said, William. Um, I'll pull up a little, like, visual play just for fun from... Uh, presentation I did back in 2012 at a couple different universities nice. um, like the kind of red matter that you see in uh, Star Trek in 2009 slide I talk a little bit about negative masks um, and some of the the work to understand and play with negative mass and here you can see a little illustration of uh, space contraction and expansion behind the ship the Alcubierre drive um, and yeah, the, the negative mass problem and the problem of trying to contract and expand space itself, um, you know, is one of those, those things that kind of, as you, the more you look into it, the more kind of infeasible it really it becomes in terms of the, the general approaches. Um, but I have seen, you know, uh, while, while there's been kind of like a lot of, you know, big splash about the warp drive and you know they did this whole video of like Canada we're gonna build an enterprise and it's gonna be this you know epic proof of concept and things it's a lot of that's just kind of splashy uh you know NASA trying to get some more funding kind of thing <laughs> um but there are some very very practical uh applications that are in in place and some of these uh look more like what we call field resonance propulsion um, and that's, that's some of the kind of theoretical approach that I've heard Nassim talk about and discuss. Um, but I've also been in person to several laboratories, uh, in particular one gentleman that I know who has, you know, several prototypes deeply in action, you know, he's 95% done with a quarter scale model version of this, which literally creates, uh, using a confluence of laser light, it's creating, um, sort of a resonance with the structure of the vacuum which then basically is used to subtly adjust the gravitational field around the object um, and this is you know this is kind of an output from us understanding that there is sort of a gravitational wave field to space-time and that because space-time is geometric um, it's possible to actually align uh, electromagnetic frequencies with the electromagnetic structure of the vacuum itself and actually adjust the field in space time. But what I think is really the next level and where we really want to get to is what I call circulating light beam um, uh, gravitational adjustment. And the idea here is that what you do is you are creating a, a closed loop around an object, um, what's often called the closed timeline curve, but that can also be defined and described as literally an event horizon around an object 
in which you're creating a field separation between uh, the internal gravitational or space-time field of the craft and the structure of space-time outside of that craft. And then with this kind of separation and sort of time-like curve that you are creating around an object, then what happens is that object is no longer um, uh, basically constrained by the rules of acceleration in terms of the object moving through space-time. In other words, it's able to slipstream through space-time without bending the surrounding space-time, sort of you know, pushing space-time like a rocket does and creating this warp, which warps space, it warps time, and creates all of this time dilation type effect. And instead, you, uh, you actually have this envelope around the craft, and then, then the key is using light as your medium for communicating with the fabric of space the location of the object. So then it's not actually about motion, but actually about establishing the current location of the object and a potential future location of the object. And so I've thought through a lot of the different aspects of how you would develop this kind of craft with a gravitational envelope and then use things like pulsars as navigational beacon points and then relate the electromagnetic frequency um, in the event horizon of the object to space-time to sort of tell space-time where that object is then going to be located.